Hello, I'm Judy Stiles. Thank you for joining us today on Newsmakers. Well, November is approaching and it's time for elections again, and this time it's the midterm elections. We're hearing a lot about national issues. Perhaps if you watch national news, it's being discussed. But what's happening locally and what are our thoughts locally? And we're going to focus on that today on Newsmakers with three professors from Missouri Southern Social Science Political Science Department here. And thank you for being here today, Will Dillahanty, Joanna DeFelt, and Nicholas Nicoletti. Thank you for being here. And I'd like to get the three of you together because you each have a sort of a different perspective when we talk about politics. So let's start off with just a brief introduction for our audience and what would you say your area of expertise or how this ties into the politics? Oh sure. Um, you know, my area tends to be uh, in American politics uh, with some discussion of political theory but generally uh, my area would be in political behavior and you know dealing with some of the national institutions like uh, Congress and the presidency. Okay. My area is obviously law, but then mm -hmm. I also uh, run the legislative intern clinic and I teach state government, so I tend to focus more on the local issues instead of national. Right. And this election does have some state things to talk about, so yes. we'll be discussing that as well. Um, I study the interaction between domestic policy and foreign affairs, mm -hmm. uh, and so um, usually it's public opinion and how opinion actually uh, interplays with foreign policy. Um, and also uh, national trends, public opinion. Right. Well, each of you mentioned things I'm sure we'll be bringing up in discussion today and involving your expertise. And when you look at the midterm elections this year, November of 2014, what are your general feelings? And we're still, as we're recording this program, weeks away from it happening, but uh, is it going to be something we're going to hear a lot more about as it gets closer, or is it going to be kind of just under the radar? Well, um, locally, I'm not sure that there'll be as much emphasis as there would be kind of nationally. I think the national issue is the question of, uh, kind of partisan control of the U.S. Senate, mm -hmm. uh, and a very narrow kind of um, margin of victory for, you know, uh, in this case, potentially Republicans. So I think that's potentially going to be the focus at the national level. But I guess here in the state of Missouri, it would be more of the uh, constitutional amendments and the implications of those. And when you talk about the state of Missouri and those amendments, it takes a long road before those get on the ballot. So people may have heard about them last spring when the legislature was meeting, and now they're actually going to see them. Sure. There were numerous uh, initiatives and referrals, but um, nine this year made it. We had five in August and then four coming up in November, and it's going to be very interesting to see what they do with those four. Some people might be curious, how do you decide which ones are August and which are November? <laughs> well, sometimes it's a strategy decision. If you have a... a an initiative coming up that you think you don't want to have a higher level of voter turnout, you would definitely put it on the primary. Mm -hmm. um, so that we definitely saw that strategy come into play. Let's face it, some of the things that our legislature is referring to the ballot are things that they may not want passed. And a good example of that would be um, the famous puppy mill Proposition right. B a few years ago, mm -hmm. which they let go to a ballot and then repealed it when they met the following January. So a lot of politics involved in giving the people a chance to vote. Very much so. <laughs> and when you look at, of course, internationally, there are headlines all over the place right now. Do you feel that will also be something on voters' minds this year? I think so. I think um, ISIS, the role ISIS is playing right now in Iraq and Syria is going to be an issue uh, as we move into November, um, almost like sort of a referendum on the Democrats' performance in office when it comes to foreign policy. Um, but generally, as we approach, we'll probably hear more about the midterms in the news media. Mm -hmm. But as I'm sure we'll probably discuss, turnout tends to be much lower in midterm elections, and people generally don't pay as much attention, um, which is why some of the some of these strategic uh, initiatives get on during midterms and and you know during the primary election. So I do think it's going to play a role, um, but I think domestic politics will play m more of a role in the midterm elections. Two years from now, if we were at the same desk, we'd have a much more heated discussion of the presidential election and everything involved in, and, Senate, yeah. and tying into it. Well, we hear about the uh, control of Congress, that mm -hmm. issue, and mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned a very narrow margin. People are, you know, if you look at the national media or publications or web, they're mm -hmm. making little maps and showing which states are right on, you know, going either way. Mm -hmm. So that control of Congress really plays a role for what might happen in the next two years in Washington. Well, sure, um, especially if, you know, if the Republicans can, can take control of the Senate. Uh, I mean, you know, essentially, it further uh, restricts President Obama from you know trying to do something in the final two years of his you know second term. Mm -hmm. um, it will be interesting to see if some of the Democratic incumbents can be you know, and, you know taken out of their seat. Uh, the other interesting thing is many uh, some of these Democrats are actually retiring, um, which makes it you know kind of more uh, competitive in the context of bringing in good challenging candidates. So 
national politics, I think it, it creates difficulties in terms of legislative and executive relationships. What well, do you feel that I know polls have shown that people, the approval rating of Congress and approval rating of the presidency, you know, right now, there are a lot of people upset around the country just what's happening in Washington is you know, saying nothing's happening. Well, sure. I mean, in this case, I mean, I think some could argue that um, one of the reasons why Republican challengers are doing so well um, is potentially people's um, frustration with uh, you know the you know the governance by the Obama administration. Um, so it's kind of in that sense, our, you know, the public disapproval of the president is mm -hmm. influencing the success of you know Senate candidates from the Republican Party. Dr. DeFalvo, I know some people have talked about uh, the president taking actions that maybe they're questioning, are they legal? Should Congress have to prove certain things that they're doing, the presidential control versus congressional control on issues? Well, that's always going to come up. We were just talking about that in constitutional law, about the issues between the separation of powers and federalism. Mm -hmm. But I think what, what's important is knowing those rules, you would realize that ultimately the outcome of this election is not going to affect the deadlock mm -hmm. because we're. I don't think anybody, any one of us would argue that they are going to have enough members that are going to switch to the Republican side in the Senate to be able to overcome a veto. So if in, in that case, we're still not really going to get anything done mm -hmm. regardless of the outcome of that election. So you're still going to have that kind of stalemate in Washington in trying to deal with these issues. Sure. And when we look at things like the response to ISIS and the president ordering troops or bombing or whatever the situation might be, you know, there's people wondering once again maybe the control of who, who gets to tell people it's time to go overseas. <laughs> well, and it really, a lot of it depends on um, public opinion, the ability of the president to convince the public that something like ISIS is worthy of uh, American uh, intervention. And I think so far, Americans are generally on the side of yes, it is, which is why you saw congressional resolutions in Congress that are allowing for some use of force. And I think, I mean, most importantly, I think, um, Professor Durfeld is correct. If you look at the cloture rules of overcoming filibuster and the two-thirds needed to overcome a veto, even if the Republicans do take the Senate and increase their power in the House, it's not going to change domestic political relations. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think it's going to change foreign policy either, given that the President is the Commander-in-Chief and has such a strong role in the foreign policy arena. Well, when we look at some of the key states, and I mentioned there's, you can look at a map and there's certain key states that are highlighted, targeted races. We have one right next to us in Kansas. Mm -hmm. We're hearing a lot about their Senate race. Mm -hmm. and well, I mean, in this case, I mean, you've got, you know, a Republican incumbent that um, is being effectively challenged by an independent uh, candidate. Uh, you know, I mean, given the nature of our two-party political system, um, an independent candidate coming in and challenging, you know, a, a Republican incumbent is is very interesting, especially given um, you know, the nature of the electorate in Kansas. Um, so, I mean, it, it kind of shows you that even though we would assume an incumbent would have an advantage in that context, um, people can also take advantage of you know, kind of the, uh, the, the degree to which voters are f maybe frustrated with you know, the actions of the incumbent or if the incumbent has fallen out of disfavor with mm -hmm. you know, either the state or you know, national party. Um, so there are a lot of factors that influence even incumbency, even though we would assume an incumbent would be um, the most likely candidate to win. So sometimes across the nation, an incumbent can be the symbol of, that's what the problem is in mm -hmm. Washington, let's mm -hmm. bring somebody new in. Mm -hmm. Well, unfortunately, for uh, the sake of the election in Kansas, it's also the economic policy of Kansas right. itself mm -hmm. has been featured nationally as right now what not to do. So I think Roberts is also getting blamed for some of Governor mm -hmm. Brown Brownback's mm -hmm. decisions. And we're seeing that in that we're not seeing cross. People um, don't separate the two, perhaps? Right. They don't tend to. So we're seeing that they are really not involving, we were just talking earlier, into mm -hmm. each other's campaigns um, and really distancing themselves from each other so they can separate this idea of national and then the state election. And a lot of times, we saw a few weeks ago in Kansas, the big names came out to support the senator. Mm -hmm. you know, to see more of this than you would expect in the next few weeks around the country, the party's favorites coming out and supporting them? Yeah, I mean, especially if you can use that as a way to generate resources for incumbents who are, you know, potentially going to be, you know, have a competitive challenger. Mm -hmm. um, I think you probably, you might see that. Uh, the, the interesting thing will be if you see, you, you don't necessarily see President Obama coming out um, in, in NAS and supporting um, you know, kind of uh, competitive or Democrats that are facing some of these kind of competitive pressures. And I'm not sure if that's because Senate Democrats are worried about the connection that the electorate might make between himself and, you know, their actions in the Senate. So in previous elections, a pro popular president would go out and campaign for those people being challenged. Well, sure, because then you want that connection, but it's not mm -hmm. entirely clear that serves Democratic senators' interests at the moment, right. given that they have a very close, you know, kind of uh, 
issue of control in the context of the Senate. Yeah. When we look at the, here in Missouri, of course, we have congressional races in our own seventh district. There is opposition, but some people may not realize that when they hear about you know in this part, especially the seventh district, this corner of the state with its strong Republican tradition. Mm -hmm. Very much so. If you look at it, um, the trend in years, obviously, in Missouri has been that. Um, Kansas City and St. Louis obviously tend to be the blue part mm -hmm. and, and the entire rest of Missouri is red. Um, so we tend to not see um, financially dollars spent here, they'd be dollars wasted on mm -hmm. a seat in this region. So the parties at a state and national level need to be strategic and they're not going to spend money on advertising for a candidate that isn't likely to win. So we in this corner of the state are not going to see a lot of campaign advertising for those types of races. <laughs> not at all. <laughs> Tying that together. Well, we mentioned the ISIS situation internationally. Uh, you know, Iraq and Afghanistan are still areas of concern. We recently even had some troops called up from this region to go back to Afghanistan and help out over there. Are you feeling that people, those, that, those types of actions are still keeping those conflicts in people's minds? I think ISIS has been in the media quite a bit, actually. Um, and ISIS is a, is a particularly interesting problem because um, you know, the idea that a new state is being created within the Middle East, um, which is also a caliphate after the United States has just spent unprecedented amounts of time trying to rebuild and stabilize Iraq, doesn't really sit well um, with voters. I mean, it's one thing for the Iraqi government to sort of be unstable but work through their political problems. It's another thing for there to be an extremist organization that is even more extreme than Al-Qaeda to take over. Uh, and also, you've seen... Um, ISIS tell the American people through, you know, the Iraqi leadership and others that they're going to attack on U.S. soil. And so that gets uh, media attention for sure. And so ISIS is something that I think Americans believe it, are, it is a threat. And that will play um, into somewhat of the midterm elections, especially for those senators and, mem and members of Congress and members of the House who voted f in favor of mm -hmm force because it's still very controversial to, you know, a force in Iraq is still very controversial. And of course, the president, you know, ran on, uh, you know, retreating or bringing everybody, bring <laughs> everybody home from that conflict. And so re-entering it is, is going to be significant for the, le the legacy of the Obama presidency as well. Mm -hmm. So it's really tight situation for their administration to show that we still want to bring home, people home, but we have to be strong, and you're kind of that balancing act mm -hmm. between the two areas of concern. Mm -hmm. So they have to keep a close ear out for what people are saying, what their concerns are. You know, you're hearing the media. I mean, there's yeah, I, yeah, I mean, th th there's the potential argument to be made that um, midterm elections are potentially more empowering in the sense that, I mean, you've got the public choosing uh, members to you know, serve in the Congress, mm -hmm. whereas in the case of the you know, presidential elections, um, you know, the public is only indirectly controlling the outcome of you know, the presidency. Right. So um, it's kind of strange, I mean, for those who study American politics to think about the lack, relative lack of interest in midterm elections, um, but many would argue it's a function of you know, media attention, et cetera. So I think this, you could conceive of these as empowering elections, but for a variety of reasons, uh, the public doesn't. And maybe it's just, do you think the, the impact of advertising on campaigning, you know, I mentioned not, maybe a lot, of, a lot of spending in Missouri, but just nationally and how much parties are spending to get people elected nowadays, mm -hmm. does that have an impact on today's voters? You know? Well, sure it does. It, I think you're going to see a lot of money spent in the next 30 days. And so that's what's going to be interesting. We were debating and talking about that because so far some of the money's been held back mm -hmm. until we really see where everybody stands. A lot of the polls are coming down but within a 4% difference, which is the margin of error on a lot of those polls. So we're going to see a lot of money spent everywhere, um, and I think you're going to even see it on some issues like the ballot initiatives. I think mm -hmm. that's where, if we're going to see anything down here in Joplin, we're going to see some advertising on those ballot initiatives. And of course, that is the statewide issue, that the issues that people are looking at here. Uh, we had those in August. Let's talk about some of those that are coming up in November, some you know key key ones. You mentioned the four here coming you in November. You have four. You have one that's going to affect your rules of evidence for criminal cases. Mm -hmm. That'll be allowing um, evidence of prior um, crimes. Now, what's interesting in this initiative mm -hmm. is it says whether they're charged or uncharged. Mm -hmm. So hypothetically, evidence of a completely uncharged crime can be used in a trial. So I think there's some constitutional mm -hmm. issues that might come up even if that oh, guilty before, pass, yeah, yeah. Innocent before being <laughs> um, But that's one that the legislature deferred to the ballot. Mm -hmm. um, the teacher tenure is obviously a hot button right. issue. Um, that is one that was an initiative um, not sent to us from the legislature. So the people gathered the signatures and brought it to mm -hmm. the state. Took about 100, I think this for this one it took 158,000 signatures across the state to get that one on. Mm -hmm. um, so they, it takes 8% of, of how many people voted in the last general election. And um, 
That one I think is going to be one that's the most interesting because I think people don't understand tenure sometimes in the first place. And the ballot wording is very short as opposed to what the bill itself says. And that's an issue that, uh, like you say, people may not understand it, but the school districts have taken stands and we've seen local school districts coming out and making statements. So that's, people are talking about it in the education level at least. Oh, very much mm -hmm. so. I mean, we've heard about it, but I think it is concerning that we haven't heard about it as much in the media, but maybe mm -hmm. in the next month. The other two, I think one is the voting period. I don't see it really having an effect or being an issue, but the, f the fourth one, which is the one I think is the most interesting, is basically an attack on the governor's mm -hmm. veto power. Mm -hmm. um, so it'll be interesting to see w what the citizens think about that because it's really changing the fundamental relationships between the governor and the legislature in Missouri. You know, that come up to the, come as a result of the partisan politics, I mean, your Republican controlled legislature and the Democrat governor, you think that's what generated that type of proposal? Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, we are sitting with a very divided, um, you know, Republican control of the House and Senate now for several years in Missouri, which is interesting because most people don't recall back in the 90s it was, um, the pendulum had swung the other way. Mm -hmm. um, so now we are in a completely con Republican controlled House and Senate, and they, we are having veto sessions. I think this is the third year in a row. I'd have to double check, um, but of a veto session in your state. So it's really, we're really contentious right now. And do you feel that those issues that if the people pass them, they still will face some sort of legal battle that somebody may challenge them? I think it's interesting because if we take away, really what they're trying to do is take away the governor's ability to reduce um, the expenditures they've made based upon projected outcomes. Mm -hmm. I think my question maybe as someone who's looking at a more practical method is how does how do we maintain a balanced budget mm -hmm. without looking at the projected incomes for a state just like you or i get a paycheck we have mm -hmm. to know what's coming in before we spend out and if we start to look at you know take tools away that help us figure out how to maintain that balanced budget i'm not for certain what we will turn to so it may create some more challenges for the state definitely and, uh, looking down the road for that we well, mentioned uh, voter turnout and uh, i'm curious since we are on the campus of missouri southern state university you work with students in political science what sort of thing are the students saying we'll start on the international level do you have students involved in international classes yeah i mean the, generally political science students tend to be um, attentive mm -hmm. right? we have uh, in the united states about 25 percent of the public is what we consider the attentive public actually following along uh, with politics and making you know choices that are that are um, usually based in partisanship but on some more knowledge uh, with midterm elections one thing to remember is that midterm elections have much lower turnout than presidential elections and there's a theory in political science called surge and decline and the idea behind surge and decline is that during the presidency you have higher turnout and the winner of the incumbent gets a surge in the number of voters that vote for them including independents when we move to the midterm, independents generally don't vote in the midterm because they're not as attentive because the media attention isn't as large. And so you get a decline and what you have is an energized base that lost from the previous election. And so that's why you tend to get, you know, in midterm years, the opposition party tends to take control or gain seats in the, in the House uh, and the Senate. And so the lower turnout actually has an effect on um, the outcome. And so people who want to have their chance because they didn't last, win last time are out there saying we want to try to get in <laughs> to the party this time and get involved. From the aspect of students and in the legal aspect, you have people, you know, ask, you've talked about some of the issues. Do you have students in your law classes looking at, you know? Well, we've talked yeah. about the federalism issue when mm -hmm. we then reduce it to the states and we compare to powers. I think what my students are talking more about, we have higher voter turnout in Jasper and Newton County when you compare it to a nationwide average. Mm -hmm. So we are trying to, figure out, I guess, why is it that even though maybe we aren't getting money spent and we aren't contested, why do we have such a high voter turnout? So that's one thing actually we were just discussing today. What is different about the people of our area that even when you know it's only 30% or 37% nationally, we still were sitting at 45 to 50% turnout in a midterm election, which is, it's unheard of to have a 45 to 50% turnout in a midterm, mm -hmm. and that's where Joplin's been hitting. And even so, though you don't have those big hot button issues, they're still coming they're out still to vote. They're still coming out to vote. <laughs> and <laughs> I, when you pull the national chart, I just looked at it again this morning, we are consistently anywhere from 7 to 10% higher than the national turnout. So people who are paying attention, they're listening. They're it <laughs> makes really us feel good as professors <laughs> in Joplin, I guess, that people are paying attention. And of course, in your classes, you know. Well, mine, uh, yeah, I'm teaching a, a, a political parties and elections course, so mm -hmm. it, it makes it much easier when you're talking Tiger. about these issues, you know, to t you know, reference the midterms. My students are really interested in the Senate. Um, mm -hmm. They're really interested in kind of what are the factors that allow, you know, an incumbent to lose or allow a challenger to win. And so we've talked a lot about the strategies of winning, 
um, you know, talking about how you mobilize voters, use resources, things like that. So it's, it's a great way to apply what you're learning in political science and, you know, the real world of politics. So are you picking the states that really have these contested Senate elections and well, kind of watching them as part of class? Interesting enough, my, my students are the ones that do the choosing, and mm -hmm. then we just apply what we're talking about in the context of those elections. And so it kind of gives them, you know, a, a context for thinking about, uh, you know, what does it mean to be an incumbent, what are these advantages, et cetera. So, I mean, it's... Mm -hmm. You know, it, it makes it easier for me in that sense to right. show the connections. They have that interest and yeah, they're involved exactly. in trying to do mm -hmm. it. Well, the midterm elections obviously decide key races, but setting the tone for two years from now when you're going to have those presidential candidates. And do you see that people are perhaps not necessarily involved in this election, but posturing for what's going to come around in you know 2016? Well, definitely so. I mean, I, I think um, it's not entirely clear that the outcome itself would predict um, you know the. Uh, election outcome in 2016, but um, I think you know, it is true that I mean the, the outcome of this election might give us an understanding of what is to come, and especially those candidates that are ultimately going to uh, run for the presidency. Mm -hmm. um, now, those candidates have already, I'm sure, have been working diligently to kind of get ready for uh, 2016. So I mean, it could be you know a basis upon which to make a choice in 2016. Sure. And it seems like in presidential election years, it keeps getting earlier and earlier when people start declaring that they're a candidate, or you mm -hmm. start, you know, publicly have people hitting the campaign trail. Do you anticipate that again for 2016? That we well, barely have this election behind us and go. You already saw that. I mean, when Hillary Clinton was two weeks ago flat out asked the question while she was campaigning, I believe in Iowa for another candidate, she was. Ex I mean, that's unheard of to already ask, "Are you already w willing to do this?" And and then when you saw the uh, reaction from other people um, after it's reported she's going to run, you start to see different um, committees form already mm -hmm. to support her in different states. So it's interesting to see that that's already happening and here we are, you know, two, two years. years away from that yeah. election. <laughs> and a lot of times in the presidential elections, and we look back to President Obama, people two years beforehand may not have heard a lot about him nationally. Mm -hmm. Are there some silent candidates out there perhaps that are, you know, not the Hillary's, the ones that are in the headlines all the time that might, you might sneak into that, you know, spotlight in two years? That's a very good question. I'm not entirely sure that, I mean, I think in the case of Hillary Clinton, I, I mean, she's a very dom, I mean, a very dominant uh, personality. I mean, she's got the, you know, relationship to, um, you know, former, former President Clinton. Mm -hmm. um, you know, she's served in the Senate. I mean, she's got, you know, a lot People of... People name recognition. They yes, exactly. Yeah. I mean, I think she might be the presumptive nominee for the Democrats. Um, I guess maybe the more interesting question possibly is, you know, who's going to run against Hillary for the Republicans? What are the Republicans, Republicans going right. to do for their exactly. side? Are there yeah, exactly. some unknowns on the Republican side yeah. that are coming up yeah. and so forth? You know, I'm, some have argued uh, maybe for state governors. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so maybe Bobby Jindal might be a good example of one. Um, you know, I mean, to the degree that the Republican Party is divided internally, and I'm not sure if you're going to get you know, maybe a more conservative uh, candidate, especially as a counterbalance to the presumed liberalism of Hillary Clinton. So it, there might be a lot of things that would condition the Republicans' choice. A lot of things that come into play mm -hmm. over the mm -hmm. next two years. In the state of Missouri, as far as uh, offices, we don't have a lot to look at this time. But once again, we have two years from now those offices that'll be coming up. Do you feel that whether it's the people being that are in the state Senate, the state house, or already in positions looking at maybe moving around in 2016 to some new offices? I think absolutely. If you um, Missouri has a wonderful, wonderful tool that you can go and research and look at funds that are already being collected by people. Mm -hmm. And I encourage all citizens, including our students, go look at these websites, look and see who's saving money already. And I think it's interesting to see, because of our term limits in the House and the Senate, um, we end up often with multiple, what we would call qualified people who are all fighting for the same Senate seat because they have been term limited out of the mm -hmm. House. Mm -hmm. And I think that we saw that here in Missouri a few years ago where we lost all of the state representatives who are immediately around Missouri Southern all in one year and had a, what we would call an entire freshman mm -hmm. class. Class coming in, right. And but their terms are going to be up all at the same all time again. All at the same time again. So that definitely plays into the idea of, you know, are you going to, this has been your, your ally, your friend these last few years, and now mm -hmm. you're going to be in a position of possibly having to run against them if you want to continue to work for the state of Missouri. You go on to the next level of the Senate. Yeah, know, from there, exactly. Right and existing office holders, I know uh, the governor took a trip to Afghanistan. People might be wondering, what's the governor of Missouri doing going overseas? Are those international concerns tying into state issues as well? Well, it could also be posturing for a potential run. I mean, mm -hmm. a lot of people have have said that Nixon may be looking into sort of a presidential bid. And a lot of the things when you are president that the people want you to have is a strong foreign policy background. And so, I mean, if you remember back when Hillary Clinton was running in the primaries, you know, she tried to bolster herself by saying, I traveled with, you know, Bill Clinton, my husband. Mm -hmm. and. 
Um, that kind of got her into a little bit of trouble uh, in that uh, election as well. But yeah, that, that could be posturing for um, you know, the, the future. That could also be looking to see because um, you know, your, your state has people going into the military and so you also, the, the governor is the commander in chief of the National Guard and the National Guard is often pulled into conflicts and that could also be you know, some, some looking into to, to those types of issues. Mm -hmm. So a lot of things people are talking about. We've talked about the ISIS and so forth. Uh, the economy, uh, gas prices are dropping. The, they say the unemployment rate is down. Are those going to be considerations that people will be thinking about, or is that just a side? Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean the, 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 the aggregate statistics aside, I mean, if people feel like their life is better off, um, you know, in their environment, I think that might have an effect on their ultimate choice. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, many people have argued, for example, that the reason why Bill Clinton in part was so successful uh, as a Democrat was, you know, the you know wonderful economy in the you know early to mid 1990s. So, but I think it's how people perceive the economy, not necessarily because you see, you know, you know small the numbers changes. could be one thing, but yeah, yeah. I mean, it, may, it might change people's perceptions. But the question mm -hmm. is, you know, am I better off? Meaning, can I, you know, pay my bills and you know feed my family and then maybe save for my you know children's college? Mm -hmm. And that takes, I think, longer to have an effect than simply you know changes in percentage points. But it could still, nevertheless, be used by. Uh, office holders to try to argue that hey, you know, the effect of these policies are finally coming, you know, into effect, and you'll be better off with us in office versus the. So it could opposition. be tied into a campaign. Exactly. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I think it could be. Yeah. So and try to develop that mm -hmm. image and tying. It. Well, you mentioned for people to become, you know, find out about the websites and get information. What do you encourage for your students to become informed voters? You know, we have these issues. Well, how do you do that research other than picking up the morning paper if they still do that, or looking online, you know, or reading? Most Actually, Missouri uh, was one of the first states to really put all of this out there on the internet for you. You have the Missouri Secretary of State website where you mm -hmm. can access everything from our salaries to the Constitution to your state seals to the actual laws you're voting on. People mm -hmm. don't realize that that ballot language is a summary that someone had to write to make it small enough to fit on the ballot for a very, it could sometimes be a very lengthy bill. If you go to these websites, you can click over and read the actual language. So really, and it's simple to find. Um, if you just type um, Missouri, Missouri Secretary of State, you're, it's going to drop you right to it, and it has a wealth of information. Hmm. Sometimes people read through those and realize that there's a clause in there that I don't really agree with, and that changes their opinion of an issue. Exactly, or the cost of it. Because hmm. one example would be the welfare. People talk a lot about testing welfare people for um, drugs. You know, When hmm. people realize that that program would cost more than it could possibly save, it failed in many states. So it's important for people to actually go find out what is it, how is this actually going to affect me. Become an informed electorate <laughs> voter. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd like to thank the three of you for visiting with us today, providing some information. And I'm sure your students are gaining a lot of information. Hopefully, we've helped the community as well as we look for the November election. And thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Us. Thank you. You're welcome. And I'd like to thank you, the viewers, for joining us this week on Newsmakers. Remember to go out and vote the first week of November. I'm Judy Stiles, and I hope you can join us again next week at the same time on the station. We'll see you then.